Okay, everyone, let's build a hygienic macro expander. So, uh, all right, all right. so if you're here, I'm mostly going to assume you know what a macro is. But just in case you don't, um, by a macro I mean when I want to write an abstraction for use in programming that can't be written as a function. So as an extreme example, I've got show result here. Its job is not only to run this expression and give me a, a person icon out, but also typeset the code right next to it. So it's a kind of extreme example that can't be a function because not only do I want the result, I want almost the text of that expression. And I've written it here in a hygienic macro and the details of this macro are not, not so important. Uh, here I've written the same thing in a non-hygienic macro system with a def macro, sort of traditional list macro. And you see the result is almost the same, but in this case the person is a lot smaller. That's because the height of the person was accidentally made to be the height of the text typeset. Right? And that's because the macro defined height and that shadowed the height that I meant to refer to right here. Right? So when we talk about hygiene, uh, that's the kind of thing we're talking about, not mixing up the variables, making it work more like functions even for things that can't be written as function. Uh, so Racket provides hygienic macros, Scheme has provided it. Uh, Clojure provides an approximation to hygiene that makes certain things easier, but it doesn't work when you have, it doesn't give you full hygiene when you have local macros or macro defining macros or so on. And we need that full generality in Racket to do all the other kinds of things we do with building languages, like here's a typed Racket program that will interact with, uh, with other Racket programs, um, and that relies on hygiene to manipulate the program, or things like our documentation system, where the bindings uh, you know, serve multiple purposes, both for actually running the document and for typesetting documents with hyperlinks. Okay. So, uh, now in case you didn't know, you have some idea what a macro is. I'm also expecting that you have some idea of what hygiene is about, uh, but we're gonna go more into that. Um, what I'm especially expecting you not to, to know coming in is about syntax objects. And this is the mysterious technique, mysterious hopefully until just today, um, that is used to implement hygiene and make macros work the way we want them to work. Right. So um, let's look a little bit more at hygiene and about simpler programs even. So here in this example, I'm defining x. Uh, I'm being intentionally uncreative with the variable name x as you will see. Uh, but X I have in mind here is some computation that might actually not work. I'm starting up my program, I'm trying to compute X, maybe it's good and then I'll get to use it other time. Um, uh, if, but if X didn't work at the beginning, then I'll have to do some other computation. And because this pattern is going to happen a lot, then I have a pre-made OR macro. So pre-made OR is not a function because the expression that I give it E, I don't even want to evaluate E if X turned out to be available. I'm just going to use X uh, with this short circuiting OR. So you can see I'm not really saving myself a lot of typing, but I'm introducing a new abstraction, the idea of use the pre-made value or uh, evaluate the expression E. And here's a use of pre-made OR. So I have an X, a different, completely different X. Uh, this X is gonna be bound to a function that I haven't shown, but apparently it does a bunch of work that I'd prefer to avoid and just use the pre-made uh, value if it's available. So I'm either gonna use the pre-made value or do all the work of calling the function X. Right, that's what X in parentheses means. So because pre-made OR is defined as a macro, the macro system will recognize that binding and it'll try to match up the use with, uh, with that pattern there and the X will match up with E. So it'll use X for E as we expand this macro uh, and then we have OR X call the function X. And you can see I've painted in orange the parts that the macro expansion introduced to help us remember that we didn't intend for this X to have anything to do with that X. The color orange is somehow not enough for that. We're gonna see what is enough uh, as we go on, but you know, we're just illustrating the problem here. And it's not that orange means only look at the top level because uh, this could be in any nested binding scope. Right? So we'll have to work out the problem in a general way. Uh, you may also know if you've seen anything about macros before that OR is a canonical macro example. So the way the short circuiting OR is implemented, it's a macro that evaluates the first expression, binds it to a variable, if that value is true, then it returns that value. Otherwise, it goes off and evaluates the second expression, b. Right? So that's what makes it short-circuiting. Again, it can't be a function. And when we expand or into its let form, then we get more things introduced by a macro. And here I've painted them green. And you can see that the green x has nothing to do with the orange x, which has nothing to do with the blue x. The green colors are maybe working out a little bit better for us, but there's still something unexplained. Right? Traditional solutions to this involve renaming them so that they're not called X, but you have to rename it just at the right time. 
uh, and it gets complicated. So um, we're going to sort of step back and, and think about why we have to do that renaming. What went wrong with generalizing lexical scope here? Right? It, and what's going wrong in a way is that we're trying to take uh, this two-dimensional view, uh, just a text in a box there, and figure out, remember and figure out where the x's came from. Right? But it would help if we had more dimensions, because it's really that let codes, the green part, came, you know, it wasn't there originally. It came in from the side through some other dimension. And if we can think of it more like that, then we'll have better tracking, something closer to our geometric intuition that makes simple lexical scope work well. Uh, and we'll be able to do that with colors, just not by using individual colors on, on names, as we'll see. So to get to that, we're trying to generalize lexical scope. Let's start again with lexical scope, but look at it in a way that'll let us generalize to these different, um, different dimensions. So uh, e, if you're used to reading scheme or list code, or even if you just ignore the parentheses and, and look at the indentation, you'll pretty quickly figure out the binding structure here, right? This x is meant to be bound by the, the top level x. This x, in contrast, is going to the shadowing binding there, whereas y goes to the argument to the function, right? Lambda is a fancy way of spelling function. Right? Uh, and this should be completely obvious to you, right? Because what you're doing is, in two dimensions, just finding the nearest and closing binding. Right? Another way this picture is sometimes drawn is with uh, drawing regions. So this x is bound in its scope, like everywhere that's in the pink area here can see that particular x, right? And this orange x is bound in its scope. Everywhere in the orange can see the x, and the same for y in the blue. The blue region is the scope of y's binding. Now, because your uh, brain is used to dealing in the real three-dimensional world, you just automatically assumed that those panes stacked, right? That orange was not covered up by blue, that in fact, the orange is still behind this x, and that's why it's in the scope of that x. But to make that fit in two dimensions clearly, then I'll just stack the colors all together on top of each identifier. I left the binding contours here for a moment, but uh, we'll, we'll just erase them because we have all the information we need here. This X um, is in the pink and the orange region, and in particular, orange is its binding, so this X is in the orange region that's in the scope of that binding. Okay. So we'll throw away those lines, and we just have these identifiers with colors on them. That's going to be a syntax object. That's the punchline. And how does that help us with binding? Um, well, this x uh, is supposed to be bound by that, that uh, binding instance right there. Right? And we can see that. We're recasting it from a two-dimensional look at nearest, nearest kind of binding thing to a problem about comparing these colors. And it's just a subset comparison. This x is in pink, orange, and blue. That binding x right there has pink and orange. And pink and orange is a subset of pink, orange, and blue. So binding is determined by subsets. Now, you may say, well, OK, but there's this other x up here. It's in pink. Pink is also a subset of pink, orange, and blue. And that's true. It's a candidate binder uh, for that use x. But the other one is more specific. It's a bigger subset than that one. Right? So, so you know, just like it's the nearest enclosing binding in 2D, when we look at it in the scope way, uh, we're talking about finding a binding whose colors are a subset of the use, and it's the biggest such subset. The reason this is a good way to look at binding uh, compared to the other way of characterizing it is it generali generalizes nicely to macros. So now we draw in the expansion of or. We have let x if all of those are in green, reminding us that they came from the macro. If I tried to draw what the contour is the old picture, that wouldn't be quite right because it suggests that this green is inside the blue. And it's not. It's like on a completely different orthogonal plane that's very hard for us to visualize. So that's why we collapse it down into two dimensions and just you know, paint the identifiers with all the relevant colors. Right? That's how we get the extra dimensions that we need to deal with macroscope. And then let's double check the subset rules. Uh, this right here is in pink, orange, and blue, which clearly is not a subset of green. Therefore, this x will not bind that one. It'll continue to be bound by this other one. As the macro expander continues here, you know, the reason it painted things green is because it expanded a macro. And the rule is going to be when you expand the macro, the new things that come from the macro get a fresh scope or a fresh color. And then it'll continue, and it'll say, oh, this is a binding let. So I need a new scope for this axis binding, and that's where the yellow will come from as the expander proceeds. Right? So what we're getting to today is writing the expander, writing the, the implementation of these rules at the bottom. Generate a new scope on macro expansion, and when you find a binding form. 
uh, you know, you could run this through our original example and it works out. You know, the, the pre-made or gets in pink and blue and we end up with this orange and blue X which is not bound by this X but is bound by this X that's just blue. So that example works out and maybe you'll take my word for it that we've tried a whole bunch of code and it, it, it does work out and does the kind of things that you want. Right? The intuition matches up in practice. So these regions or colors, that's what I'm drawing as a scope. And when I have these stacks of colors that I put behind identifiers, that's a scope set. So this is exactly the, the things that we need to implement in our implementation. Um, and then a syntax object, as I said, is just gonna be a symbol paired with a set of scopes. And with that, we'll be able to build a racket-like macro system. We're not gonna build the whole racket language. So we'll do the usual thing where you wanna understand the concept. We'll boil it down to the smallest language I know how to implement uh, with this kind of macro system. So it'll be the lambda calculus. We'll have uh, functions of one argument, we'll have identifiers, and we'll let identifiers also re refer to primitives like cons and list. Um, we'll have function calls. All right, so that three, it, those three parts are just the lambda calculus. We'll have quote, um, and this should not be surprising, right? We were, we're building up on the list style of just quoting parenthesized things to represent expressions. So it's gonna be handy to have quote in there. And then we have the two macro parts proper. So let syntax is going to bind this identifier locally as a macro implemented by this expression, and quote syntax will be a literal piece of, piece of code that we want to push around somewhere, right? A generalization of quote, as we'll see. So for example, here's uh, the simplest uh, macro, and so it's going to be a dumb macro, but a simple one that we can work with, right? So this lets the macro one uh, be a function that takes a representation of one. So here's a use. This is the binding, this is the use, right? We're calling the macro with zero parts. Um, so that means this use, one, is gonna go in as the argument to this function. What it's gonna return is quote syntax of quote one. So quote one will be the expansion of this. So the whole gray cloud expands to the bottom gray cloud. Uh, the whole thing just expands to quote one because we used a macro, and then after you've expanded macros, the definitions of the macros can go away. Okay. So this is what we're implementing, the process that takes this bit in the gray cloud to this bit in the gray cloud. A macro definition in use to its expansion. Just as another example to show you more why the syntax object goes in, um, this is gonna be a thunk macro that has an expression but doesn't evaluate it, it just wraps it in an extra lambda wrapper. Right, so this thunk one goes in as the argument STX and the code here, it uses second of STX to pull out the quote one and it puts, together, puts it together with a lambda and a quote syntax and we end up with this expansion. Right. So that gives you a simple, there's no pattern matching here. We're getting rid of all of that potential complexity, of uh, matching patterns and substituting in the templates and just boiling it down to functions that are able to manipulate syntax objects to implement macros. And you can build the rest up in terms of macros. That file icon on the top left, that's gonna fill in as we generate all the code. So that'll give you a sense of progress and scale as we go. Uh, and we start out with just one line, so it's not gonna grow very fast at first, but uh, rest assured it will accelerate and still be uh, understandable as we go. We're starting off with uh, the representation of syntax objects, and that means we need to pair a symbol with a set of scopes. We do that in racket notation using the struct declaration. So this introduces a new record type, syntax. I've made it transparent just so that it automatically works with equality. So if we wanna represent the syntax object X with no scope, Right, with, with an empty set of scopes, uh, we write that in code like this. Right? This is a syntax record that has the symbol X in it and an empty set of scopes. If we want X with a single scope on it, um, and I'm gonna let SC1 be the pink scope in all my examples, this is how we'd write that in code. Somewhere I have to define SC1 and we'll do that in a few slides. Right? But I put SC1 in a set, combine it with a symbol X, and that gives me a representation of this bit of code. Right? So this is a syntax object of value that represents this piece of code that might be in a program somewhere. Syntax object with two scopes, just as you would expect. Uh, this struct declaration also defines a few other things that will be handy for us. Besides the syntax constructor, it makes a syntax question mark predicate. So a syntax question mark of a syntax object is true. A syntax question mark on anything else, like a symbol or a number or a list, is gonna be false. Right? And that, that syntax question mark name is bound by the struct syntax declaration. Another thing bound there is syntax hyphen E, just takes these names and sticks them together with a hyphen. That's an accessor function. 
So it takes a syntax object and extracts the symbol. If I use syntax E, syntax scopes is gonna extract out the uh, scope set. Okay. That's almost all the racket special stuff you need to know for, for as we keep going. Um, in this simplified macro uh, expansion, we are just putting scopes on identifiers, on syntax objects, but I'm still gonna use identifier as a, as a word sometimes so that it scales up, but um, all syntax objects here are identifiers. Datum to syntax, it's gonna be handy for writing tests or writing certain kind of macros to take a plain S expression, something in quotes, and coerce it into the syntax object world. And the coercion is straightforward, you just uh, add the empty set of scopes to it. So datum to syntax on the symbol A gives me a syntax object, which has the symbol A and uh, no scopes on it. If we give it a one or some other kind of thing where we don't keep scopes, it just leaves it alone. So datum to syntax of one is still just one. If we have a list, and here I've got a list of symbols, A, B, C, datum to syntax is going to apply the empty scope you know, recursively. It's gonna recur down to the list, the nested lists, and so on. So A, B, C goes to a list of syntax objects, each with an empty set. And finally, if the input already has syntax objects, so this happens when you have a macro that's manipulating pieces and putting them back together, um, then it's just gonna leave that one alone. So here I've got symbols A and C, they get empty sets. Uh, but B gets left alone and preserves its uh, set of scopes, just the pink scope. Okay, and we have the opposite operation. So it'll be handy under various circumstances, including writing tests, to be able to take a syntax object and throw away all the scopes. That's the job of sy data syntax arrow datum. And so if you have ABC, convert it to a syntax object, convert it back, you just get the same thing. Finally, we're gonna represent scopes as a record, um, and this time I'm just making them opaque. In principle, we need to make up a new color every time we make a scope, but I'm just gonna let the memory manager do that for me. It'll pick an address in memory to be the color, and so I'll use eek to distinguish uh, those, those different colors. Right, so SC1 and SC2, by creating separate scope records, they're separate scopes. Uh, they're not equal to each other, but SC1 is of course equal to SC1. Uh, and then when I write scope sets, I'll just put these things into a regular set. Set is like list, it just makes a set instead of a list. Okay, so now we can take plain syntax objects, get them into, sorry, take plain S expressions, make them syntax objects. We can make scopes, we need to be able to add the scopes to the syntax objects. That's what this function does. Um, and it's, you know, the details, if you read it, uh, read the code, it'll just say what you expect, which is uh, if you take a, Plain syntax object X, add a scope like the pink scope, then you get X in a pink scope, written this way. Uh, syntax object X with that empty set uh, gets a set with the pink scope. Um, add scope is also gonna recur for us, so we can take a big expression and add, add the scope everywhere in it. Right? So if we have X and Y and we turn it into a syntax object and add the scope, it'll go everywhere. Actually, we're not gonna keep add scope um, because we're gonna need a flipping operation also. So what we'll keep is a just scope, which is the generalization of this that abstracts over the operation we do. Right? And then we'll define add scope and flip scope in terms of a just scope, because they're pretty much the same thing. Um, so add scope as just one more example, if we have a X with a pink scope and we add an orange scope, it's gonna have pink and orange. If we, um, if we have a pink scope and we add pink scope, it's a set of scopes, so that doesn't change anything. We still have just the pink scope. Flip scope is an XOR operation. Why do we need this? You'll see it's, it's handy for writing the, uh, the macro expansion, expander part later, but it's just XOR, so if we have pink and we flip orange, then we get pink and orange. If we have pink and orange and we flip orange, then that just leaves us with pink. Okay, so I hope all the pieces so far are pretty straightforward. Uh, if you had five extra seconds, you would actually read all the code. Um, the next thing we need to do, now we can represent all the syntax objects and manipulate them in all the useful ways we need to. Next is to keep our table of bindings. <coughs> so as the macro expander goes through and it discovers a let form like this, it needs to record that there is such a thing as an A with pink binding. And we're gonna represent bindings just by, uh, we'll just use GenSim. We just need to make up some token to represent that particular binding. Uh, the other possibility besides a GenSim is uh, an intern symbol like lambda or cons to represent a primitive. 
So if I uh, had this, this uh, example, let with a pink A, the macro expander is going to call add binding with a pink A and whatever token it's made to whatever is convenient for it, and in our case a gensim is enough, represent that binding. Uh, in this case I've got B and a shadowing B, so that's a pink B and a pink and orange B, so I'll call those the, the outer binding and the inner binding. And I'm going to use these uh, examples a little bit more as we go through. So um, be great if I had better names, but remember A is the one by itself, B is the one with shadowing. Right? And uh, I would register those different bindings in the obvious way. Right? Pink and orange B gets the inner binding. Last, the last uh, configuration here is C, where I have two non-overlapping bindings. So I've got a pink C and an orange C. Um, and so those are two different bindings, and they'll end up with two different registrations through add binding. Uh, so that was a lot of examples for three lines of code, right? but that just sets up the, the kind of binding examples that we'll need as we go through. The opposite of add binding and resol is resolve, and resolve's job is to take an identifier. We won't look at the details of the code necessarily, uh, though we'll talk about the helper functions. But its job is to take one identifier and find a binding that was previously registered. So in the process of expanding this code, we would have registered a pink binding for A. So if we use resolve with A and a pink binding, we should get that representation of the binding back, the loc A that I made before. Uh, if we ask about A with pink and orange, if an A actually appears here, it probably has orange as well. It's resolve's job to find the A pink um, and give us that original location. In the case of um, A with just orange, Resolve will say there is no such binding. There is no binding that has a subset of just the colors orange. Uh, in the B case, when we registered those bindings, the pink B and the pink and orange B, then the pink C should find the outer binding. The pink and orange B should be mapped to the inner binding, and uh, just an orange B will again not have a binding. Finally, there's the C case. Uh, pink C should find the first one, an orange C should find the second one. A pink and orange C, something has gone strange, right? Because in this case, C, pink, and orange are not overlapping. Uh, in this case, there, you, you get an error from the expander, right? This w oh, could only happen if a macro has done something weird, and a macro could cause this to happen, uh, and you want a good error message in that case. Right. Okay, so the way resolve actually works is kind of in three steps. Find all the good candidates, Find the best of those candidates, make sure there's no ambiguities, and then look up the binding for the best candidate you found. And um, you know, we could look at some of these examples, like um, when you have a pink A, there's only one possible matching binding. Uh, let's look at the B case. When you have B with pink and orange, then it's the job of find all matching bindings to find both the pink one and the pink and orange one. Right? Right? If you have a, a pink and orange C, it's the job of finding uh, find all matching bindings to find both of the, the possible C bindings. Right? And it's the job of check an unambiguous, right, that's just finding the best binding you found, the one with the biggest set, and make sure it's consistent with all the candidates. And if not, like in the C case, it just raises an error. And the last little bit on our binding representation is that we need to put all the primitives somewhere. There are no reserved words. Right? You can use lambda as a local variable name if you want, and our expander accounts for that, and the way it does that is um, all of the core forms are bound in a particular scope, the core scope. So when you start off your program, you, imp you import the core scope, and that's how you get to lambda and all the other things. So if we took lambda and coerced it to a syntax object without any scopes, then resolve would say false. But if we put it in this core scope, uh, by adding that scope, then resolve will give us, tell us, yes, that's the primitive lambda form. Same for cons or lists or other primitives. Um, this, is a, this is an operation that we need to export to the world. So when someone's using the macro expander, they need to initially import the core bindings. So we'll just wrap this up as an introduce function. Uh, it'll make some of our examples a little shorter. Right. All it does is add the core scope. Okay, so congratulations. You're a third of the way there. Right. That was all the hard parts, the representation of uh, syntax objects and binding and doing the resolution. And the rest is just traversing through a structure, uh, traversing through an expression to expand it. Right? So the part we have left is to write expand, which actually does this expansion. We know now how the bindings are going to match up, how this one is going to be resolved to that one. We know how syntax objects can be manipulated to get the quote one out. 
If we write this example as a test case now, we can write it like this. Take that S expression, convert it to a syntax object, introduce all the primitives, and then expand. We haven't written that part yet, but whatever you get back, it's gonna be a syntax object, so that's the expanded form. If you throw away the scopes, it'll be just quote one. If you don't throw away the scopes, it'll be a syntax object, um, which will have the word quote in it with the core scope to confirm that it really is the primitive core form, uh, primitive uh, quote form. Uh, and the one will be by itself. Um, and because expand produces a syntax object, that means you can expand and re-expand and rearrange the code and re-expand it again and so on. The job of expand for lambda then is, uh, for macro uses is as before. Expand on an application. So this is a function called to list with two arguments. It just recurs through and expands uh, recursively, which means the, the one call turns into quote one, right, if we're in a suitable context. Expand's job on lambda is a little bit more than that. Lambda x, you know, the identity function expands to itself, but in the process, we recognize that this is a binding and that that x refers to the argument there. So expand is going to take syntax objects and give us back syntax object with more scope on it and with binding registration so that we can match things up. Um, so uh, that example right there looks like this. If we introduce the primitives to lambda xx, we're gonna get out a lambda xx where they'll have a scope on it. So that's how the binding table that we just did, uh, how that's going to help the macro expander. Uh, it's not quite enough information for the macro expander. The macro expander will use, when it encounters an identifier, it'll use resolve to find out it was a particular argument and it'll know just to leave it alone. Um, but this kind of situation could happen again. Uh, we could encounter an X with a pink scope on it outside the binding region of lambda. Again, this is something that a broken macro might do. Uh, and that, the expander will have to deal with that case. Um, and so it'll have to know which of the bindings are actually available um, when this kind of reference happens. So um, a similar thing can happen with macros or we need to find the macro. So that's why there's one more piece for expand. It needs that global binding table but it also needs an expansion time environment or a compile time environment to map each binding to its meaning. It's a variable, it's a macro that's implemented by this function, or it's not available and you have a, a variable out of context. Um, so that means the, the environment maps a binding to one of those things. Binding table takes an identifier, maps it to a binding, environment takes a binding, maps it to its meaning in context of expansion. We'll represent a compile time environment just with a persistent, persistent map. So uh, nothing special here. If you try to look up something that's not available, you'll get a false. If you try to look up something that is available and it refers to a variable, then we'll have this constant variable that it returns. If you look up something that is bound currently as a local macro and that you can use as a macro, then environment lookup will return a function, right, an actual function that we can apply to implement the macro. Which brings us to expand, finally. So expand has an argument S and an optional argument for the environment. It's optional just so we can start it out as empty. The cases that expand has to deal with then, right, we just look at all possible cases in our grammar. Uh, it can deal with an identifier by itself, which uh, is probably just a variable with some scopes. Expand has to deal with, all right, the, the possibilities are variable, or now variable in parentheses. That can be a function call. That can be a use of a macro. That can also be a, a primitive form, like a lambda form. So it'll be the job of expand ID application form to deal with those. Uh, it can be a list that doesn't start with an identifier. And in that case, it must be some sort of curried function or a macro that expands to a function or something like that. So it's always an expansion, uh, always a function call form. And anything else in this language, there's no self-quoting because it's as simple as possible. So one by itself would just be a syntax error. Okay, so we've reduced the problem to expand identifier, expand ID application, and, and expand general application. An identifier by itself, just walk through the cases again. So expand identifier is gonna be used on something like X. Um, if instead of x, it's like uh, cons, which is probably a typo, right? It might be some variable that doesn't even have a binding. Uh, that's going to be a free variable. So we'll raise an error. If it's cons spelled correctly, 
right? Then its binding will be the symbol, quote, cons. And in that case, we want to leave it alone, right? Cons expands to itself. If it uh, is bound to, quote, lambda, that means it's a primitive syntactic form, and we used lambda without an open paren. Otherwise, we'd go to the other case, right? So that's also a syntax error. So it's, if it's not false or a symbol, it must be one of these gensims. So then we need to look in the environment to see if it's actually available. If it is available and it's a variable, like we get to this x under that lambda, we leave it alone. If it's not available, that means something has gone wrong and we give an out of context error. And the only remaining possibility is that it's a function. And that means it's a macro implementation and we called the macro without an open paren. So in this expander, we'll just raise an error in that case. Okay, so expand identifier. We've only got a couple of functions left and half the file to go, so they must be interesting functions. Uh, expand ID application. This is the one, remember, that could be a function call, could be a macro call, could be a primitive syntactic form. If it's a primitive syntactic form, those are the only four cases. So we'll just cover them directly. Well, we'll defer to expand lambda, expand let syntax. That's more of the file. Uh, but we can take care of the other two quote and quote syntax because nothing happens. When you expand a quote form, it's left alone. There's no sub-expressions. When you expand a quote syntax form, it's also left alone. It's meant to be a literal piece of code. You don't use it now. It may be the result of a macro expansion later. This begs the question of what's the difference between quote and quote syntax. And from the macro expander's perspective, they're actually not different. It's when you evaluate them that the difference will show up. So we'll see that later. Right? So that's a key thing to understand. Quote syntax or quote, the difference is evaluation, not expansion. Uh, so if it's not one of those primitive bindings, again, it must be a local binding. Um, if it's a, um, a procedure, that means it's a macro invocation, like one. So we will, uh, well, I'm going to defer that to apply transformer. So that's another bit of code we still have to work out. Uh, anything else must be a function call. So actually, it could have been a primitive use, um, in which case it's not in the environment. In any case, it's not a macro use. It's not a primitive syntactic form. So we'll defer to the application form. So I don't know if you're keeping track, but it's about four functions that we still need to fill out that we've assumed exist. That takes care of expand ID application. Uh, and the most recent of those was applying the macro, apply transformer. So apply transformer in our one example, that means we've gotten down to the one in open paren in parentheses. So that's what's coming in as the macro application we want to expand. T, we looked up in the environment, and that was a function that returns one, quote one. So um, you know, I'll just rewrite quote one the long way, open paren quote one. The, the key step inside the transformer, apply transformer, is to just to call that function on one and get the uh, quote one out. But we don't actually return quote one. Remember that when we apply a macro, we need to paint in a fresh scope everything that was introduced by the macro. So what's going to got to, what has to come out of here is a, a quote one where the quote is in blue. And that's because we made up a new scope right there. Um, and, and that's where the blue comes from. Except you see, I don't use add scope, I use flip scope. And that brings us to our traditional macro trick. How do we know what this function introduced? We know because actually um, we paint the original form, this thunk x, we paint it with the new scope we made up. So we do it backwards. We paint in blue everything that's not introduced by the macro because we know what all those things are. We call the macro. It rearranges things and gives us a result back. And we can see the blue, which is the part that was originally there. Everything else wasn't originally there. Then we just flip it all around. Well, we flip it all around and the things that were blue are not blue and the things that were not blue were light blue. So that's how we just detect what a macro introduces. Um, and that's uh, applying a transformer, which brings us, you know, if you're able to keep track, all we have left is function calls, functions, and local bindings, local macro bindings. Function calls are easy. You've got a sequence of expressions, you just map expansion over them. Function calls are a little more interesting. So this is where we have something like lambda x, f applied to x. Uh, we do some pattern matching to pull out the x and the f of x. We make up a new scope for the binding x. We add it to that x so that we got a pink x now. 
Uh, we register a new binding, a new representation of that particular x that's bound by lambda. Um, and then we say in our environment, as we expand the body, yes, the binding for pink x is available. And in particular, it's a variable. We've got the body, which originally is f of x, but we need to add the pinkness to it so that x, the pink x is visible. We take that pink f of x, expand it, nothing happens. It's still, because f expands to itself and x expands to itself, it's still pink x, and then we put it all together again. So that's how lambda, jobs, that's how lambda does its job of introducing the binding registrations and matching up the body with those, uh, with those arguments. And then it let syntax. This is where we're finally actually evaluating macros. So we have a let syntax form like this one. We do some pattern matching to pull out the one as the binding, uh, but also the right-hand side here as a quote syntax, uh, as a lambda of quote syntax. So at this point, we need to somehow turn that into a function that implements the macro. And we'll come back to that. So now we've made our stack a little deeper. We have to implement a val for syntax binding. It's going to be easy, it turns out. So somehow we take this bit of syntax and we get an actual procedure that takes an argument and returns quote syntax one. Right. So we make up a new orange scope for the one itself, um, and this is very much like um, the lambda part. You know, we bind one with orange, and then we map it in the environment, and then we expand the body expression. The body expression is, starts out as just open paren one, close paren. We paint it orange. That way, this orange one is going to be the one that we mapped in the environment. So it expands. It eventually calls apply transformer that we already introduced. Apply transformer makes sure it's a, a light blue quote. And uh, that's exactly the answer we wanted. Right? This form expands to quote one. Okay. Evaluating the syntax binding. So we have this expression on the right-hand side of a macro. We can expand it. That's easy. Uh, we expand the right-hand side. Now we need to evaluate that. One option is to create an evaluator, just a little, make a little interpreter. Right? The other option is, well, we're in racket, so we've already got an interpreter. Right? So we compile our S expression, our syntax objects into plain S expressions, use the racket evaluator. Right? You could use JavaScript or so on. The key thing is it doesn't matter that this evaluator knows anything about macros, because we've done all of that work. We've, we've expanded away all the macros. Right? In particular, our compiler just takes the core forms and translates them to core forms as plain S expressions. Uh, as it does so, anything that used to be an argument variable, um, it, gets, uh, it uses this gensim that we made up. So there's no shadowing either. Right? When we hand something off to the core evaluator, there's no macros, there's no shadowing. We've taken care of all the binding issues and the expansion issues. The other thing you see here is that for quote, we just throw away all the scopes. But for quote syntax, we compile it down to a, a primitive quote form where all of our scopes are still attached to it. Right? So we have this live object that we're embedding in the middle of an S expression, which is just fine for most list of interpreters. Right? Right? And that's, that's the difference between quote and quote syntax. Just keep all those scopes around so that they're, late, evaluate, they're alive and still available for later. Right? Wow, we're almost done. So this is, in fact, just boring. It's just the boilerplate to use the racket evaluator. The key thing is it gets a plain S expression where lambda xx has turned into lambda with some gen sims, um, and it evaluates it, and uh, we're all done. So if you uh, take the code we built, it's something on this scale. If I can uh, get it right. It's about 250 lines of code. I know it felt a lot longer than that. Um, if you're really into this, you might need a few more minutes to look at the code, so there's the URL. Right? In that URL, the repo has multiple branches. So the Pico one is the one we just built. Um, if you add implicit quoting, that's only a little bit more. Uh, if you organize the code so it's not just one big 300-line file, then it, uh, you know, and start using better abstractions, then it grows to that. If you start adding module systems, it grows to that. If you do the full racket expander with all the bells and whistles, um, then it's a lot more. Okay? But that's because we build our whole life is on this, right? Uh, type jacket and and slide presentation systems and so on. Uh, but uh, it's all there, and you can sort of use these as a guide to, to grow up to the massive implementation there at the end. Thank you.